Hello coaches. Welcome to the Via Sports Studios. My name is Allison McNeil. Uh, I'm a basketball coach, our former Canadian national team coach. I uh, spent 12 years uh, coaching our senior national team, which culminated with a trip to the 2012 Olympic Games in London. I'm excited to spend some time with you here during Coaches Week in BC, and I'm um, going to talk a little bit about the lessons we learned from London. These were lessons we learned along the way, uh, but certainly they were solidified when we got to London. So I'm going to start immediately with uh, a picture of our Canadian Olympic team from 2012. Um, I have never seen such amazing smiles on a group of women. When do you ever take a picture and everybody looks fabulous? Well, in this picture, everybody looks fabulous. And I guess that's how you look when you qualify for the Olympics. Um, interesting story in this picture. This was in Turkey we qualified. And um, we got the last possible birth to the Olympic Games. And it was on Canada Day. So it, it couldn't have been scripted any better. It was a storybook ending to a, 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 a four or five, actually 12, <laughs> 12 years of building uh, this program and a lot of people doing a lot of work. But just so proud of this team and um, what they did. And uh, I think they're well on their way to getting to another Olympics in 2016 in Brazil. Uh, that's our Olympic team. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the lessons, as I said, we learned along the way. And, and coaching, I think, um, you start to think about what kinds of things did we learn how, how did those things come about? And I think they could, these can be used by anybody. These are not for basketball coaches. This is for any coach. And actually, I've said they've really helped shape my life more than anything. Um, so first of all, you have to believe in your vision. And I think it's easy as, as people outside of coaching at a high level or, or any level, really, where people will say, well, why is she doing that? Or why is she doing this? And you have to really believe in your vision. You have to sell your vision. Uh, if you don't believe in it, why would anybody else? And sometimes, you know, there's people all the way around you that don't believe in it. And, and I would have to say, even at times, there were people in our Canada basketball organization. I totally get why they were not, not necessarily grooved into our vision. But, uh, but at the end of the day, they supported us. And this is probably my favorite quote. Whatever course you decide upon, there's always someone to tell you that you're wrong. There are always difficulties arising which tempt you to believe that your critics are right. To map out a course of action and follow it to an end requires courage. It's not easy. It's not easy to believe in your vision and when other people are questioning you. And I know when I was a young coach, it was even more difficult because you weren't that self-assured. And so, um, you know, if someone questioned it, you got a little shaky in your vision. But I will say this, if you're going to believe in your vision, you're going to sell your vision, then you have to work to have a great vision. And you have to really work to study and know your craft. Um, and I think another thing that's uh, really important that we found over the time with the national team is you need completely dedicated and committed people. The average age of the uh, women playing basketball at the Olympics and World Championships. At the World Championships in 2010, the average age was 28.7, so almost 29 years of age. We had the youngest team there at 24 years of age. So we had to find athletes that were dedicated and committed to the long term, to building a program um, for a length of time, and also staff and people around that were committed to the long term. Um, it's tough to be great. It's tough to, it takes a long time to get really good. So um, I like this picture because that's me on the left, and then that's Teresa Gabriel on the right. And uh, Teresa Gabriel was our national team point guard. She's from Mission, BC, and was on the national team for, I think, 16 or 17 years. Uh, you quit counting after about 15. But anyway, she's a completely de dedicated, and I thought she uh, epitomizes that dedication and commitment. And then you might be wondering, well, why am I showing this? this uh, slide of these three athletes. Well, these three athletes were the cornerstone of our national team. And um, I think it was Mike Krzyzewski, who coaches at Duke University, who said, you're only as good as your internal leadership. And I'd love to stand up here and tell you that I am just the most amazing coach that led this team to the Olympics, like woohoo me. But really, <laughs> it was so many people, but it was probably these three women as much as anyone because their internal leadership, their internal fortitude, uh, their drive and determination to get Canada to the Olympics after having not been there in 12 years was enormous. Um, Teresa had been to two Olympics and two worlds. And this group of athletes, um, were, we qualified for the World Championships in 2005 and then went in 2006 for Canada. And Canada had not been to the worlds in 12 years. So it's all in these 12, 12, 12, and 12. We knew it was sort of a, a sign that we were going to the Olympics. But that was the first year we qualified. After that, only these three athletes returned. So it's pretty hard to build a program uh, around that. So we really had to find athletes that were more uh, driven, relentless, dedicated, and want to be part of the program. And along that process, we lost some people. And that's the way it goes. When you, when you up the ante and you say, hey, it's going to be better, we're going to be better, then some people are not ready for that kind of commitment. And, and that's fine too. Um, I want to put this slide up because I think when you work with people that you really care about, uh, in fact, I mean, I'm a little emotional when I look at the picture because that's outside the Olympics and I'm there in the middle. And on um, 
my, uh, to the right on the screen is Lisa Tomitis, who's our current senior women's national team coach. And on the left is my husband, Mike, who is also a, an assistant coach. But we worked together for 12 years. And that's kind of unheard of in sport because people, you know, want, want the limelight. They want to be head coach. They want to move. They want to do this. And I think part of why we were successful um, in this national team program was the continuity of coaching. And our athletes knew what was coming. But it's 12 years of working together. And I bolded and, and capitalized together because that's what's important if you're working with people. You're not going to get anywhere by yourself. You have to get commitment. And um, also, I'm just so proud of Lisa. And they're going to be heading to the uh, world qualifier in September. And uh, pretty sure we're going to a third straight world championship. Um, one of the lessons that we learned, I think, was and everybody's heard this saying, but it's, are you committed to doing it? So don't be afraid to give up the good to go for the great. People say that all the time. Well, what does that mean? To us, it meant, like, look at this picture. There's some pretty happy women, not quite as happy as qualifying for the Olympics, but this group of women had just won the bronze medal at the Americas, medal around her neck, on the podium, we're headed to the World Championship. But we knew right then, this is heading to the 2010 World Championships, we knew right after that, and this is no joke, we went back to the hotel and our coaching staff said, this team and that performance won't get us to the Olympics. It's going to get us to the World Championships, but it's not going to get to the Olympics. So that's pretty good. But we had to kind of give that up to go for the great. And so a lot of our athletes changed, a lot of our staff changed, and, uh, and it's hard because we felt good. We felt good right there, but we want to feel even better by getting this team to the Olympics. We spend a lot of time on team chemistry, and I think if there's one thing I've learned about team sport, but even individual sport when you have groups of athletes training together, you need to have chemistry. And the best teams have chemistry, they communicate with each other, and they sacrifice personal glory for the common goal. That's just a given. You cannot be successful uh, without having good chemistry. And interestingly, we had great chemistry amongst our athletes, but we had as good, if not better, um, amongst our coaches and staff. And I think that really showed, and the athletes know that we're all in it together. Um, and chemistry doesn't just happen. You know, people say, oh, we'll go for a team dinner. That's not how it works. You have to build it every single day in training. You have to build a communication system. You have to have core values. You have to have, you know, the things that you're going to demand of your athletes. They have to know why you're demanding those. And, um, and chemistry has developed over time. And, and that certainly was a... And I actually had people come up to us at the Olympics and say, you know, you don't have as much talent as some of the teams, but man, you guys are together. We see you in the village together. You play as a team. You play well together. And I think that was our secret weapon. We had great team chemistry. Um, this sounds kind of funny, but at any level, I think you have to have practice expectations. And we sort of morphed these over time. And our athletes, um, we had a leadership group that was also involved in this. So come mentally prepared. You know, it sounds simple, but you have to do that. Come with energy, intensity, and enthusiasm. We had a 40-day training camp, which is unheard of, again, in, in, um, in team sport to come together that many days in a row, people giving up their lives. Boy, they had to bring energy, and intensity, and enthusiasm every single day. Be ready to compete. It, whether it's against yourselves, against somebody else, against the standard, every single day you have to compete. And we talked about embracing the difficult because it's always been a difficult road for us. When we didn't qualify, um, well, we qualified in 2006 for the Worlds and finished 10th. And then in 2010, um, we uh, finished 12th. And that was difficult because we lost our funding. And even though we had a plan to get to the Olympics, sometimes that happens. So I think embrace the difficult. And we kind of laughed about it later because getting to um, the uh, uh, Olympics on Canada Day on the last possible berth, and we had to beat Japan and Argentina, <laughs> who we had beaten us the summer before. So it was storybook, I have to say. Um, Next thing that I think is really important is we talked about having some building blocks to success and we talked about this with the players. So how we play, what we believe in, and who, who we are. And those things, I know when I first um, sort of approached people in Canada basketball and said, I, I think we need to talk about these things, people laughed a little bit and said, well, it's the national team. You know, yeah, how you play, but what you believe in, your core values, who we are, like, you know, it's the national team. I'm like, you have to have those things. So we talked a little bit about how we play. And I'm not going to go through all that, but you have to decide how you're going to play. One of the things that we talked about, we're going to play hard, we're going to play smart, and we're going to play together. That was really important to us um, because that way we could maybe beat the teams that had more talent than we did. Uh, what we believe in, our core values. A lot of people said, again, our core values are really important in the national team level. Absolutely. So trust and integrity, accountability, respect, commitment, honest communication, relentlessness, and resiliency, being able to bounce back from, from things. When we, when we finished 12th at the Worlds, after being 10th, it didn't deter us. We said, we're on the path, we know where we're going, we know what we're, we're about to do. And then who are we? I mean, that's really important that you define who you are. And so you can see what we talked about there, striving for excellence, um, being the hardest working team, 
everybody's saying that, but you have to prove it every day. Uh, be the most unselfish team. Um, a winning attitude in training and competition, that's important. And also being a great teammate. When you're together, when we, when you're together like we had a 40 day training camp, you better be a good teammate. It, it's pretty difficult to be around people that aren't kind of up and excited and, and wanting to do what they're wanting to do there with training. Um, so we had a saying that the year before we, um, so we went to our qualifier and finished third, which meant we didn't get a direct berth into the Olympics. We had to go to the, the second year, uh, world qualifier. So we had this saying, win the day, put on the back of our uh, practice shirts, and um, we had signage made so it was in our film room. And what we talked about was, if we can win every day at training, then coming that one day, and it did come down to the one game to get the Olympics, as most things do, um, then we'll be ready. If we don't have an Olympic performance, in practice, why all of a sudden are we going to have an Olympic performance that day? And so that was what we strive for. We strive to have uh, to win each day, and each of the athletes took that um, upon themselves to win as a group, but also for them to have their Olympic performance every day. And so not just showing up and expecting to have an Olympic performance to get us to the Olympics. And I think at the end of the day, that kind of training that we had really prepared us for the resiliency that we had to have uh, to take that last birth to the Olympics. This is probably, actually, a, a sports psychologist from Toronto who I'd never met sent me, emailed me this, um, this slide, and, or this, sorry, this uh, picture he got from the Hamilton Spectator. I had never seen it, and it might be one of my favorite sport pictures of all time. And if you want to lift yourself up, lift up someone else. Uh, and what I liked about this is everybody looks at this picture and thinks, oh, that's really cool, but we practice that. So if someone goes down in practice, our players actually run to them and help them up. Why? Because you want to be able to feel that in a game. So someone either took a charge or maybe she just tripped on the line, I'm not really sure. <laughs> but, but our team is over there and that's everybody, that's five players that are on the floor at that time helping her up. And we talked a lot about if we're going to get to the Olympics, we've got to do it together. If we're going to get anywhere, we're going to, we're going to have to do it together. So I, I just love that picture because it says a lot about our team. Um, this is a great li life lesson, but a great lesson for me. When I was a young coach, I was afraid to ask for help. And this is a good friend of mine, Tom Elwood, and um, I asked him to come over. He's a, a school, uh, high school teacher and coach on the island, and I asked him to come over and kind of analyze our team, come to practice, watch us, take notes, be as critical as possible. He knows the game really well, um, and, and he came over and did that. But when I was a young coach, there was no question that I was extremely um, afraid to ask for help. And not because I thought I knew it all. That definitely was not it, but more because I was afraid that someone would come into practice and see that maybe I didn't know something and I knew I didn't know everything and when you're young you don't ask for as much help as you should and one of the things that I found out I am um, I uh, did my level four my NCCP level four and I did it um, through the uh, Fraser Valley and so I had uh, some profs from University of Fraser Valley that were were my teachers our teachers and I ended up um, making a connection with Roger Friesen, who's a sports psychologist, um, he's been to many Olympics, and he, he was teaching one of my classes. And he said, you know, if there's anything I can ever do for you, and I went home that night thinking, well, I'm, I'm not going to ask him. I would never ask him. And then I went, you know what? We need a sports psychologist. We have no money. I am asking him. So I just popped him an email, and four years later, he committed to four years helping our, our team. Tom was doing stuff. I got someone to do some video for us. I uh, connected with Jason Brandenburg, who was one of my profs at um, doing my level four. He consulted with us. He's an exercise physiologist. Next thing I know, we had a, we had a staff. We had a, a team. And um, you just can't be afraid to ask for some help. <laughs> That's the key thing. And here's, uh, that's Roger Friesen, uh, who is our sports psychologist on the left, and then Anne-Marie Thuss, who our, was our manager with the national team and still is. She was the first manager I ever worked with, and I don't think I would have made it through my first international trip without her because I wasn't prepared for the bad food, the horrible travel, all those things. I just wasn't ready. Uh, and then Lisa Tomitis, our new national team women's coach, and on her, uh, sorry, the far right of the screen is Joni, who's been a, um, a physiotherapist with the national team for over 30 years. So as much as you know, the coaches had a lot to do with us getting there, the players had more to do with it, I just feel like there's no small roles on an Olympic team, but I feel like there's no small roles on a team. If you make everybody feel like they're part of it, and they are, if you believe that, which I did, we would be nowhere without any of these people, and I know Lisa feels like that now with, with the, um, what we've built, um, you, you've got to get help and don't be afraid to ask for it. That's one of the key lessons I learned. Um, cooperation. We talked a lot with the national team about what does cooperation mean? Can we be super competitive in practice? Can we just you know, be there ripping each other's hearts out to compete? 
and also cooperate. And I just believe that you can. So cooperation is the thorough conviction that nobody gets there unless everybody gets there. And that, that was something we talked about and lived by. So practices were highly, highly competitive. And in team sport, when you're going at the same people day after day after day, it can be pretty tough. But we also said, okay, can we compete and cooperate? And, and uh, I'm here to say you can do that. You can get your team to, to buy into the team, but also just get after it um, in practice, uh, uh, forcing each other to be better. Um, again, at the end of the day, we did it together. That's how it worked. So this, uh, when I look at this picture, what I'm sort of most maybe excited about is all the black shirts. Because when we started with the national team, um, I've been in the program 16 years, but when I started as a head coach 12 years ago, we had you know two assistant coaches, a physiotherapy, and that was it. We had no sports psychologist, no exercise physiologist, no nutritionist, and, and all those things came over time because we asked for help and uh, people were stepping up and helping. And then OTP jumped in and, and gave us some really good help uh, towards the end. You can't get anywhere without passion, energy, and enthusiasm. And I think that's um, one of the things that this, this group of athletes had. But I think it came from the top down. I, I'm a pretty enthusiastic person. I'm pretty passionate about my sport. I'm passionate about coaching. I'm passionate about the athletes and the women that I work with. And we had a well, physiotherapist that had been there 30 years. So surround yourself with people that have that passion because you're going to need it because <laughs> it's tough. There's tough times. And I think the energy and enthusiasm that people brought. This picture I love because I believe it's, um, we, I think Kim Smith has just scored a hoop. And we maybe are up like six or eight on um, Japan to get to the Olympics. So it kind of looks like it's in the bag. But if I'm up celebrating, then it's pretty much in the bag because I'm petrified till the last whistle or you know till the very end. So so this is right before we had qualified. Um, one of the things that uh, that that I've heard before is that you know pres the pressure is so great at the Olympics. The pressure is so great at any high level performance. Well, of course it is, but you only feel pressure when you're not prepared. So we got to the Olympics. We went in early uh, to the to the village, and our sports psychologist had recommended that. And um, people were coming up to us and saying, whoa, for your first time here, everybody looks so calm, like you're not nervous. How come you're not nervous? I said, well, some people have been preparing for this for 16 years, others for 8, 10, 12. I said, we're not nervous because we've done the work. We belong. And I think that's when you don't feel pressure because you've done the preparation. So that was the lesson that we knew we had prepared. It took a long time. We went from not a very good program to I think where we're you know we're world class we're top, we're in the top ten in the world now and uh, and and expecting great things expecting to go to the world expecting to to get on the podium in in a few years so you only feel pressure when you're not prepared do your work you won't feel pressure <laughs> that's the key and preparation equals success that's absolutely and this I went to a an Olympic um, excellent series and one of the speakers. Uh, had this quote, the biggest event in the world is an unrelenting, unforgiving environment where any flaws in your preparation are exposed. And I went, aren't you being a little bit melodramatic there? Isn't that a bit much? Until I got there, <laughs> then I'm like, that quote is just so right on. It is exactly what you feel when you're at a huge event. We felt it at the Worlds, but way more at the Olympics because there's way more going on. So it, it will expose any flaws in your preparation. And I think you know, we weren't expected to get to the Olympics and then to finish top eight and to, to, to be right there with every team was wonderful. I mean, the best thing about the Olympics, I mean, everything was great, it's the Olympics. The best thing was helping 12 women reach their lifelong goal. That, that's where you feel best as a coach. But the second best thing was just being able to play with all those teams because for years we hadn't been able to. So that quote absolutely says it right. The second quote, Repeatable excellence. If it's not done in training, then it will not be achieved under the pressure of a big competition. That is something that we had to find in ourselves 12 years ago with the national team program. How can we get our training to be so much like competition that we don't feel the pressure when we get there? And that took time. And that took athletes, you know, some leaving the program because they weren't ready for that intensity. Uh, you know, others saying, hey, I'm committed to this for the long term. But repeatable excellence. And this last quote I also love, and I got this from the Olympic Excellence Series uh, with Sport Canada, own it. Everybody must own their preparation, their training, their attitude, their energy level, and their success. So if you can get your athletes to own it, that they're not pointing fingers, they're not blaming, and you as a coach have to own it. I mean, there were, I made many mistakes when I was young. I, I understand, I think I'm still making them, <laughs> but, but especially made some when I was young, and you have to own it and then learn from it and move on. So preparation equals success, no question about that. Um, I love this picture and all I want to say is the lesson we learned is you have to have some fun along the way and everything can't be you know perform 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 it, there has to be some fun 
And um, this, I love this picture because, well, first of all, I look like a complete tiny little person next to our, one of our well, Krista Phillips, our, our biggest player on the team. But we, this was our last practice. We were playing the Americans, who were the eventual gold medal winners. It was our last practice before our, our game against them. And uh, the team didn't come out right away. And I was like, where are they? Why aren't they here? And all of a sudden, they all came in in these Nike shorts that Nike had given us a really nice big package of stuff, and these shorts were in there. So they came out in those. We had a great practice. We went through the scouting report, but they just were having some fun. And um, my direct report came into the gym, and she wanted to see us practice. So she looked in and thought it was Spain, <laughs> and she left. And then after, she said, I thought, I thought you guys were practicing. Where was the practice? I said, we were there. We were practicing. She said, I just saw Spain. I went, oh, no, no, that was us. That was us in our yellow and red. So they were just having a good time and making sure that they enjoyed the experience. And I think I was most proud of our team. We, we went to the opening ceremonies. We talked a lot about that but it's an unbelievable pageantry, and I think that the players wanted to do it. We walked in, walked out, and then still got our good sleep and our prep. But I think you have to have some fun along the way. And I have to say, hanging out in the Olympic Village, they put on all their Olympic gear, the lovely jackets from the closing ceremonies, all the things, and they just had a good time. And, uh, but never once did I think our team wasn't ready and focused, because I, I think that they had, we had prepared for that. But I think you have to have some fun. Let them go a little bit. Uh, opening ceremonies, as I said, we went to those, and I said, you can see those khaki pants. Uh, only the athletes at the Olympics can rock those pants, because the rest of us would look crappy in those, but they looked great. <laughs> and even um, the excitement of going to the Olympic, uh, to the opening ceremonies, I think was well worth it. So when you think about coaching your team and you're thinking we've got this or this little celebration, celebrate the moments. They're not always going to take away. Everybody said they take away from your performance. Hey, if we had to play at 9 a.m., we probably wouldn't have gone, but we didn't, and we were able to walk in, you know, wave, have fun, enjoy. Funny story with the opening ceremonies: that the players were all planning how to get on TV. Well, if you walk on this side and you come here, you know, you're going to get on TV. And so my husband and I were kind of like, eh, you know, let them go on TV. They're the ones that got here. So we were just calmly held hands and started to walk in. And next thing I know, when I get back, everybody sent me a picture. We we got on TV. So I said, sometimes, so this is a lesson from London. Trying to get somewhere and just hanging out and being calm, cool, we'll get you there. So um, we end up on TV and most of the players did not, which I felt bad for them. Um, this next slide is, I think, just sort of encapsulates everything that I believe uh, about sport. If it's amazing, it's not going to be easy. And if it's easy, it's not going to be amazing. And so at the end of the day, our Olympic experience was absolutely amazing and it just was not easy. Um, I talked about that 40 day training camp. Well, after uh, 2010 when we finished 12th we lost our OTP funding which I was very frustrated but I also get it we didn't get the results we knew what we were doing but we actually had a donor call me and he donated a uh, hundred thousand dollars a man I'd never met I'd remotely coached his girls when they were young I not from our province even not from BC and he said um, like what all of you are doing gonna donate a hundred thousand dollars and that wasn't easy he just came in and helped us and that's what allowed us to have our 40 day training camp to really change our offense and prepare so you know change is tough but we changed after the after we knew we couldn't um, qualify uh, didn't think we, well, we didn't qualify for Beijing we trained changed our offense we added more staff um, we expanded our staff we you know we changed the way we trained we brought in new strength and conditioning specialists there were a lot of things we did and that's not easy but again I'll tell you this if it's amazing it won't be easy and if it's easy it won't be amazing I hope that you've um, learned a few uh, lessons that, uh, from us, from London, and that they can help you in your coaching. And probably the biggest thing I've learned is that you've got to ask for help and um, you've got to embrace change. Those are two things that I think really helped us get to the Olympic Games. So thank you and have a great week, coaches, and uh, great seasons.